Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this uh, Monday, Jan January 11th uh, meeting of virtual regular meeting of the Livermore City Council uh, to order. We're operating under the uh, COVID rules, which we've been doing for a while. The uh, details on meeting participation can be found at the end of the agenda. Uh, would the uh, city clerk like to highlight anything with regard to the rules? Yes, thank you, Mayor. When the public comment period opens for the item that you wish to speak on, members of the public can participate by using the raise hand feature or star nine if you're calling in and you'll be unmuted by the city clerk's office and allowed three minutes to speak. Okay, thank you. I'd like a roll call, please. Council Member Kick. Here. Council Member Carley. Here. Vice Mayor Monroe. Here. Mayor Warner. Here. Now, would you um, join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? We'll show the uh, flag. And if everyone else can be on mute, I'll just uh, recite the words while uh, we get the meeting going. So, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now uh, we have item two the uh, proclamations and uh, presentations. Uh, 2.1 is the uh, Library Board of Trustees annual update. Okay, and this evening uh, to introduce the update, uh, we have uh, Nathan Brumley, our uh, Acting uh, Director of Library Services. Nathan? Yes, thank you. Uh, tonight we have Art Pontau, our Library Board of Trustees Chair. And can we have him unmuted, please? I'm unmuted. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council, and, and Nathan. Uh, thanks for having me here this evening. And if you'll pull up the slides, I'd be uh, happy to start off and uh, get the presentation going. Okay, so good evening. My name, again, is Art Ponto. I'm the uh, Library Board of Trustees Chair. I go on to the next slide. Uh, we'll be giving you uh, an annual report on uh, the overview of a year that spanned uh, in-person and remote programs, as well as curbside operations. So, so the left and the right of this, we, we had part of the year where we had full use of our library, and, and as you all know, uh, part of the year where we did not. So this uh, pre very short presentation will be, I'll give you an introduction and background, some highlights from this year, a little bit on a path forward, and uh, some good news at the end of the presentation. So uh, move on to the next slide, please. So just uh, this introduction background, uh, our library board is an advisory group which works for the city council and for the citizens of Livermore. We help set goals and objectives for the library services and uh, support the, uh, the staff in running the library. There are five of us on the board and you can see the names there in the presentation. Um, the, uh, we had one board member change this year. Uh, Wendy Graber finished her term in June and uh, Minnie Chopra began with us in July. Uh, we've worked uh, throughout the year and for quite a few years with uh, Tamara LeBeau, the Director of Library Services. Uh, she retired, however, at the end of December and now Nathan, whom you just met, is the Acting Director of the Library. And so we'll have a uh, comment or two about that later on. So uh, we have monthly meetings that are open to the public and we talk about strategic planning and action plans and patron policies adjusted and uh, different services and uh, have a, generally have had a great interaction with the library director and staff and expect that will continue in the future. Uh, next slide. So just a few numbers to get folks oriented. We serve a very wide range of Livermore residents. If there are 100,000 uh, people living in Livermore about, three quarters of them have got uh, active registered library cards um, as of a, about a year ago or so, uh, every public, middle, and high school student student ID serves as a public library card. So these are called student one cards, just making access to the library a little bit easier for our students. Uh, we offer a vibrant and uh, current collection of books and, uh, and other materials, uh, 700,000 collection uses in the last fiscal year, and about a third of those were digital library uses. We've made some substantial improvements to the digital library this year, including the, the canopy services that 
provide uh, digital streaming of movies and documentaries uh, right into people's homes. Now, all you need is a library card and something really cool called tutu.com, which uh, could, be, could be very useful uh, in these uh, pandemic days of uh, online tutoring services. Again, free to the public to access a live tutor real time on just about any subject you can think of. Uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to just report on uh, today is that, the, as you know, last year we uh, uh, opened the Rincon Library, we extended the hours, uh, the council was very supportive of that, and we're, it's, it, at the beginning of the year was open all weekday afternoons, and it was a great success, and the, uh, uh, lots more usage than there had been in the past, and uh, we, uh, when the libraries are able to open up completely again, we look forward to uh, continuing. Sorry, that. I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, so move on to the uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, additional highlights. Um, the uh, Livermore Reads Together uh, um, focused on Sourdough, a book by Robin Sloan in last February. And you can see in the lower left picture there, uh, an image of a bunch of folks uh, making a uh, sourdough starter and uh, the author came out and talked about uh, the book and there were a bunch of other, uh, as usual, uh, interesting activities around the community that uh, are tied in with that, that book. Uh, this coming February, um, just a few weeks away, uh, the March Trilogy by, by John Lewis and, and co-author and, uh, and illustrator will uh, be uh, the book that we'll we'll read together, and uh, we uh, just and I'll show you a little more uh, on that later in the talk. We've just in the last uh, week uh, nailed down that uh, John Lewis's co-author and illustrator will will present a presentation and answer questions for library patrons on February second, just three weeks from tomorrow. Um, other things that uh, happened this year, a curbside pickup started on June 1st, and that's still going at the Civic Center Library. Um, that happened even before the state was uh, quite ahead, everything so sorted out, but uh, we had met all the requirements and, and got serving the uh, community uh, June 1st, and uh, that's, that's, again, that's still happening. Uh, a lot of other stuff that we usually do in the library, like the summer reading program and a, a lot of other uh, programs that used to be done in the library live uh, were done remotely this year. And so the, the staff found lots of creative ways of uh, connecting with the community and still providing uh, library services. Uh, the Civic Center Library was actually reopened briefly at the beginning of November uh, with uh, by appointment only, uh, only with uh, very limited access. Folks were coming in and leaving with stacks of books and uh, uh, unfortunately, that had to shut down again, but the staff is ready to uh, reopen again as soon as uh, conditions permit. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to say a couple uh, uh, words about the strategic action plan. We, we, uh, we the, uh, the library director and staff uh, went through quite a process the previous year develop, developing uh, strategic objectives that are sort of outlined in the three bullets there. And uh, this year, action plans to implement those uh, strategic intent have been uh, uh, underway. And uh, so this isn't just a, uh, a plan that's sitting on the shelf somewhere. It's, it's turning into uh, real live actions by the staff. So the three, three main points were to promote literacy in all its forms for the community, to affirm equality and inclusion, a very timely topic for the community, and then also to enable com all community members to participate and benefit from library services. We find people come into the library say, uh, saying, well, we wish you had this. Turns out we do have that. And so sometimes the challenge is just to make sure that uh, folks know what, uh, what a great place our library is. Uh, next slide. So looking forward, um, as, as I've <laughs> indicated, the city can be really proud of its library facilities and the talented staff. We have a healthy friends of the Livermore Public Library. They've uh, been very uh, active even during the, uh, the difficult times and have, have uh, continued uh, healthy donations and enabled some of the uh, 
digital uh, improvements to the library that are especially useful in these times. Uh, we did lose our exceptional library director to retirement. Uh, and uh, we, uh, Nathan is a, is a great acting director, um, but we'll, uh, we'll need to uh, uh, find a, a permanent uh, director. And uh, the board is, uh, is happy and ready to support the uh, search process in any way we can. And um, overall, we invite the uh, city council's advice and uh, any community input that uh, uh, you'd like to share with us on the board to help support the, the action plans and the uh, moving forward and helping the library be all it can be for the community. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is a poster that Nathan just gave me the last few days. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the highlight of the, uh, the March Livermore Read Together that uh, will help kick off the month. So it's Tuesday, February 2nd, 6 p.m. Uh, we weren't able to secure um, the, uh, 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 the ability to uh, record this uh, because of copyright issues and such. So uh, connect via Zoom at, at uh, 6 p.m. on February the 2nd for a conversation with John Lewis's co-author, Andrew Aiden, and with Nate Powell, his illustrator. And uh, I'll tell you, a few years ago, some of us had a chance to see uh, John Lewis and uh, Andrew Aiden at the American Library Association meeting, and it was just fantastic. Uh, the book itself is, is, is extremely timely right now, and it's, uh, it's a powerful uh, description of some of the civil rights uh, activities uh, many years ago with, uh, that John Lewis was a, a legendary participant in. I'm really looking forward to uh, our community having a chance to uh, take a look at this book and, and other activities that will be scheduled throughout the month. So watch for those announcements of other activities. And finally, moving on to the last slide here, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, a, uh, a very generous donation of, uh, of money for, uh, and resources uh, funded in uh, memory of Yuli Pan, a Livermore resident and LLNL retiree and, and a devoted library patron by his family in the hope that his life's passions may benefit the library and community that were his home for 50 years. So that's, uh, you can see that statement at the bottom of the slide. The investment were to support library services in three primary uh, areas that he was very passionate about with regard to an investment center. And you can see three particular resources there in cultural diversity and also in education, supporting the tutor.com uh, uh, resource. So all of these capabilities will be up and running or already up and running. And uh, because of the generosity of uh, Yuli Pan and his family, uh, we'll have at least four years of uh, use of each of these uh, capabilities that should uh, really enhance the uh, digital uh, collection that we have to offer the community. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll just say thanks to uh, Yuli Pan and his family and uh, conclude the uh, presentation and ask the council if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about anything you uh, would like to talk about. Well, thank you, Art, for that uh, very good report. Uh, very uplifting to see all that's going on, even in these uh, troubled times. And I wanted to thank you and your uh, board of trustees for all you do to keep our library such a valuable and well-appreciated uh, asset for the community. And it certainly is one of the ones that is highly uh, used and uh, and and very. Uh, I think I think it's uh, you know it's out uh, a highlight of our community to have this uh, library and I think other communities recognize how well it's done. So any other council member want to make a comment or ask a question? Vice Mayor Monroe? Uh, yeah, so I will I'll second that. Um, library is probably my favorite place to go and of all the things I've missed this year that this might be the, the thing I miss the most. Um, I wanted to add, uh, uh, make a, just a couple other note that actually on Monday, February 1st at 6.30, there is going to be a panel discussion on racism that kicks off. Um, it is part of the Livermore Reach Together program. 
Um, so um, just, uh, I don't really want to share my screen right now, but um, if there's a, if it's available, um, I, you can look under Deliver More Reads together and you'll find it there. And then I also wanted to share a conversation I was having with somebody who is um, working with the youth on the uh, equity and inclusion uh, work that, that, that we're doing with, uh, you know, between this is with the school district. I was talking with someone with the school district, um, so cross intergovernmental work. And um, she was telling me that for teens, they want safe spaces in Livermore. They want places where they can go and places where they can feel welcome. And they said, like the library, they say when they go into the library, it is a place where they feel welcomed, they do not feel judged, they feel like there's places where they can work, where they can be quiet, where they can gather and have quiet talk. And I, it just made me so happy to hear it. And I thought you'd all want to hear that. So there you are. Fantastic. Thanks. And yeah, there are a whole bunch of activities planned throughout February that should be a lot of fun and uh, very meaningful this year. I just wanted to jump in real quick. Um, Mayor Warner, someone asked um, if this was open to people that are no, not Livermore residents um, as being a Zoom meeting um, and in COVID life, I could see this being welcome to anybody who would like to join in. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Art, um, but I think this is um, available for anybody who would like to jump in. Absolutely, yes, and that's true for all of our library uh, um, resources and, uh, and programs. If you're if you're around Livermore, or, well, actually anywhere with uh, some of the virtual things, you're you're welcome to uh, enjoy uh, what we've put together here. Councilmember uh, Carling, do you have your hand raised? I do. Thank you. So, uh, Art, again, appreciate the uh, thoughtfulness and the dedication that you and your colleagues have for the library. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the fact that RINCON has been opened again and the uh, availability of the students and how much it's meant to them, even for a few short months. You know, I think it was clear that this was a need in that part of town. And I appreciate you working with Tamara and others to uh, ensure that that was open in the afternoon for the folks in, living in that part of the community. So thanks again. You're welcome. As you know, I think that's a, that's a great thing. Yep. Okay, well, thank you, and uh, we'll see you again in another year. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Now we're going to move to uh, item 2.2, uh, the confirmation of advisory body appointments. And um, it, it, the uh, city clerk, did you have another announcement you wanted to make beforehand? I did. Thank you, Mayor. Just as a reminder to our attendees this evening, we are not using the Q&A feature. If you do would want to make a comment for public comment, please use the raise hand feature. We won't be reading the comments received over Q&A. Okay, thank you. And we will be recognizing people by the uh, raised hand feature. So do we have a uh, re uh, any report on the uh, item 2.2? Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. On December 29th, 2020, the City Council Subcommittee on Advisory Bodies interviewed applicants for vacancies on the Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District Board of Trustees, Beautification Committee, Commission for the Arts, Historic Preservation Commission, and Housing Authority, and have submitted their recommendation for City Council consideration and appointment. Tonight, the subcommittee recommends the City Council confirm the advisory body appointments and direct the City Clerk to schedule meetings with the new members to administer the oath of office. And I'm available for questions. Any uh, questions, comments from the uh, council members? I'd like to uh, thank people who applied and I'd like to thank the uh, council subcommittee for uh, going through the uh, interview process and making the recommendations. And so with that, do we have a, a motion? I'll move that I'll we accept the uh, advisory board um, nominees. And I'll second. Okay, thank you. 
Moved and seconded. Could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Kick? Uh, aye. Councilmember Carley? Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe? Aye. Mayor Warner? Aye. Thank you. Passes uh, unanimously. Uh, the next item is the uh, Citizens Forum. I'd like to remind people that in conformance with the Brown Act, the uh, City Council can't take action on the items. But I would like to point out that, you know, anything that's permit presented in Citizens Forum, but if, if we Council could or may uh, respond to some of the comments in matters initiated that's at the end of the agenda. So just want to let people know that even though we can't uh, respond to you in the Citizens Forum, we are listening and we can do things uh, later on in the agenda in, in response. So if you want to uh, do it, log into Zoom and provide your uh, verbal public comment. And uh, comments are limited to a maximum of three minutes per person per item. And uh, I don't think we have a lot of people, so I won't have to reduce the time limit. And we'll, if need be, we'll conclude the uh, forum after 30 minutes. And then if there are additional speakers, we can go towards the uh, end of the at 930 or following the public hearings, whichever occurs first. I also like to remind you that again, the, the citizens forum is for items that are not on the agenda. And we have certainly other items on the agenda tonight that are very interesting to the community. So please keep your citizens forum comments to items not on the agenda. So thank you with that. <clears throat> the city uh, clerk, would you then manage the uh, citizens forum process, please? Yes, Mayor, City Clerk's Office, please unmute and announce the uh, public comment individuals. So the first speaker will be James Hutchins, followed by uh, e. Good, e. Goodwin and then Marianne Brent. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Hutchins and I live in Livermore. I wanted to let the council know that I feel the changes to the Eden housing project are unacceptable and why. In 2018, the council approved a plan to build 132, or I'm sorry, 130 units, which they called workforce units on the old Lucky site and they enlisted Eden housing to operate the project. A diagram was presented to the public to show what the project would look like. And that diagram showed four buildings separated by a park creating a green area extending from Livermore Avenue to L Street. However, in last month's workshop, Eden Housing presented the city with a very different design. Their new design had two buildings instead of four, and those buildings were in total much larger than the previous design. The park between them had also shrunk by a third, and almost half of what was left is now hardscape, meaning hard surface like concrete. The total green area is only a third of the original design. We also learned that the units would only be available for homeless or low-income families. Even claimed these changes were necessary to meet financial requirements for the funding. And I have a problem with what has happened. These are not small changes. The buildings are an estimated 42% bigger and they have virtually eliminated the setback from L Street. Uh, so the buildings now come right up to the sidewalk as well as the path uh, by Stockman's Park. They will now be much more imposing structures on our downtown appearance. Second, the shrinking of the park and the loss of two thirds of its green area means it's now more of just a passageway between the buildings rather than a park. Third, while the original plan had a majority of the units allocated to low income, the council said many of the units would be for workforce housing, which by HUD usage is 80 to 120% of the area median income. Today, the plan is for all of the units to be for low income, so there is no workforce housing. I know some have used the term workforce just to mean that the occupants work. That is not how the federal government uses the term, and I think it is a misleading use of the word in this context. Fourth, changes to the kind of the units were stated in Eden Housing's January 2020 A1 funds application. So by January 2020, Eden knew that the plan everyone was looking at was, going, was not going to work, yet it was only in December of 2020 that they told the public. And since the city was watching over the process, they would have seen these changes in the application and also known that the public plan wasn't real. Yet for a year, neither Eden nor the city said anything. And understand that January 2020 is when they put it in print, uh, when they sent it to the county. So they knew well before then that it was not gonna work. People kept using it 
and talking about it, and especially in the Measure P arguments, yet no one said anything. So at a minimum, he didn't lie by omission. Finally, the uh, county, or I'm sorry, the city put out a list of priorities. Number one was parking, two was community character, three was open space, and four was traffic. Yet these changes go against all four of those priorities. I think this is a serious violation of what people understood it to be and approved. Thank you. The next speaker will be E. Goodwin, followed by Marianne Brent, followed by Jean. Good evening, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, well, thank you so much. My name's Emily Ramey, Goodwin is my maiden name, and I work for Y Green Energy Fund. Y Green is the word energy spelled backwards. Um, I've spoken at public comment before, and I've been very grateful to work with uh, Livermore City staff uh, over the last year plus in trying to get our PACE financing program in front of City Council for consideration. Uh, the city has already adopted another one of our competitors, so you do have one PACE financing option operating in the city, but uh, your current option does not offer financing for small and mid-sized commercial properties. We are the only PACE provider that um, offers small and mid-sized uh, commercial PACE financing. And we have a few projects locally that are wanting to use our program specifically. Uh, those include a church, a nonprofit center, two small retail centers, uh, and a large uh, corporate campus. Um, so PACE financing, for those of you new to council uh, and or other members of the public, is a way for property owners to make energy saving, water saving, uh, renewable energy upgrades to their properties. And of course, that's good for meeting public policy goals for the city. Uh, we also finance electric vehicle charging uh, infrastructure, and we also most recurrently uh, offer fire prevention uh, measures. We also do seismic retrofitting as well. And so in my discussions with uh, Adam Vandewater and Teresa De La Vega from the uh, Office of Innovation and Economic Development, um, those features of what PACE financing can, um, can cover was very important in meeting disaster preparedness goals. And I know that was a big initiative for the city last year when I met with them. Unfortunately, COVID sort of pumped the brakes on the momentum we had building early on in 2020. And we were working towards getting an agenda date uh, very close to come in front of council and simply uh, be considered to add more choice and competition to your constituents. Uh, but for some reason, um, it's sort of come to a screeching halt. And so um, I'm here to remind council, uh, the city manager and staff from that office or anyone who will take it on to uh, allow us the opportunity to serve constituents who wanna use our program specifically and simply add more choice and competition from a very viable and credible PACE finance company, which is Ygreen, uh, that makes the uh, customer experience better. So thanks so much for letting me speak tonight. Uh, I know you're talking about your climate action plan update. So separate and apart from that agenda item, I will say that hundreds of cities across the state have included PACE as a tool within their climate action plans to meet goals that they establish. So it's a very well-known tool uh, for climate action plans and uh, appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Do we have the next speaker uh, lined up? Yes, sir, sorry about that. Uh, the next speaker is Marianne Brent, followed by Jean, followed by Joanna Thompson. Well, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council and staff, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in the Citizens Forum. <clears throat> Like James Hutchins, I also want to ask you to consider the changes in the appearance of the Eden Housing Building Plan. The plan, um, as was stated before, the plan has changed substantially from the one publicized in 2020. Now, the changes, while necessary to accommodate the tenants and satisfy the state, county, and funders, will cause disaster for Livermore, in my opinion. 
One of the problems is the appearance of the two monolithic three and four story housing structures facing each other. This effect is accentuated by the four story high condos across L Street at the former Growth Brothers site. This image, this canyon atmosphere, changes the character of Livermore. Then there is the underground parking allowance of one vehicle per unit, which will certainly create congestion. Circulation gridlock and parking scarcity will not encourage anyone to drive downtown. So there's cramped housing that is too tall and creates a parking crisis. This could mean the beginning of the end for Livermore as we knew it, as we know it. Please don't do this. So my appeal to you, City Council, and to Eden Housing is to please work together to give us a better plan. Thank you. Do we have the next uh, speaker? Yes, sir. Sorry about that. Um, the next speaker is Jean, followed by Joanna Thompson, followed by Jeff Parr. Good evening. This is Jean King. I'm sorry I didn't put my last name down. Um, thank you, staff and council persons. We citizens ask Eden Housing and the City Council to save Livermore downtown by presenting a new alternative with a destination park affordable units that include workforce housing and no mass of three and four story buildings in our city centers. Thank you. The next speaker will be Joanna Thompson, followed by Jeff Parr, followed by Cal Wood. Mr. Mayor and Council, good evening. The awesome responsibility for creating a desirable downtown rests on your shoulders. You could choose to create a downtown that invites people to visit and to linger, a downtown they will want to return to again and again. Or you could choose instead to create a downtown of congestion, of dense housing and insufficient parking, a place to avoid, not seek out. Unfortunately, the current downtown plan with the apartment buildings proposed by Eden Housing will bequeath to us the latter version of downtown. You'll be saddling us with four-story apartment blocks on both sides of a major downtown thoroughfare, with traffic emptying onto L Street and overflow parking likely to take up spaces meant to accommodate patrons of downtown businesses. Your decisions will be your legacy to Livermore for decades to come. Please rethink the ill-advised Eden plan Create a downtown we will love to spend time in, not one we will want to avoid. Thank you. The next speaker is Jeff Parr, followed by Cal Wood, Paul, followed by a speaker on the telephone. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Uh, appreciate it. My name is Jeff Parr. I'm the owner of a solar installation company called Solar Technologies. We're located in San Ramon. We've been in the Tri-Valley area for uh, close to a decade now. One of the largest solar installers, uh, regional solar installers here in the Bay Area with two offices covering uh, uh, most of the Bay Area. But a lot of our work here out of our San Ramon office is focused on this Tri-Valley area. We've installed about four or five thousand, somewhere between four and five thousand systems over the last uh, 20 years. Um, many large commercial systems, uh, some you may know, uh, Uncle Credit Union right off the freeway um, in Phoenix over by Lowe's, did a megawatt there, Bake Tech, which is in uh, kind of over by that in Phoenix Lowe's area as well. Um, we've installed over 100 residential systems in Livermore and again, many more across the Bay Area. Um, Getting back to Emily's point earlier, PACE is an excellent way for homeowners, business owners, small, medium, even industrial customers to be able to turn to solar power and be able to finance these systems. Uh, the upfront payment can be a bit daunting. And with PACE financing, it gives them an affordable means to be able to pay for these systems, finance them, uh, get positive cash flow in their businesses, especially in this climate, you know, it can help them economically. 
Um, we've worked with a variety of PACE providers over the years. Uh, we work almost exclusively with Wigreen at this time. Um, over the years, we found that they are the best PACE option out there. They're the best, um, the best people, the best choice, the most transparent, the best with customers. Um, and I think it's been about four or five years now that we've worked with them. They've, they've come through for our customers every single time. So my request to, uh, to the council here is to consider Wigreen and, and approve them to be a provider within the city of Livermore. It's definitely something that contractors like myself would want to be able to bring to customers. I think it's something that customers themselves, whether it be business owners, um, houses of worship, uh, committees, um, nonprofit charities, homeowners, et cetera. Um, everyone in the area is going to want more choice. They're going to want um, options to choose from, and there can't be, given that PACE is already being offered, there can't be anything anything wrong or any harm brought to uh, to Livermore, nothing but benefit by offering more choice to uh, to the patrons there, to the contractors to bring solutions to uh, to the residents and business owners of Livermore. So I ask that you ask why you add Wygreen as an approved provider um, to the city of Livermore. Thank you. The next speaker will be Cal Wood, followed by a caller with the last four numbers of 3996, followed by Jackie Cotta. Hello, I'm Cal Wood. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, I didn't get any response. Can yes, you hear can. me? Okay. Uh, the previous speakers have all spoken about the changes in the Eden housing uh, plan. I certainly agree with that. I would like to see that the city council uh, is now able to and willing to respond to citizens uh, ideas in ways that are really important. In this case, the changes have vastly uh, hurt what was originally planned to be for downtown. And I would like to urge the city council and the mayor to put in some time to find a much better solution. There are several things that people have suggested but uh, I believe that you can find a way to do much better about downtown to give us a larger park uh, as we had been promised. And uh, uh, I certainly would like to see the city council be prepared to spend a little time and effort to get this thing done because I think you can do it. Thank you. Next speaking is the caller on the phone with the last four numbers of 3996, then Jackie Cotta and Kate Fisher. Caller, you've been unmuted, or you were unmuted. Hello, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for your time. And this is Melissa Lynch. And I just have a couple questions. Uh, this is my first city council meeting. So uh, my first question is, there's a letter dated December 17, 2020 from Mayor Warner that promised a letter of list of lessons learned. Um, I just wanna find out if that has been, um, is that on the web? I haven't seen it on the website. Has that been produced and, and will it, what date? I would, I would be interested in seeing that. Thank you for your time on that. Uh, another question too, is I noticed on the city council application was due on December 27th and the interviews on December 29th. Can you provide the process of, uh, of this uh, interviewing contact and uh, give, provide more information on that? And if there's somebody I would talk to or email instead of this forum, uh, that would be great if you could just let me know that. And once again, thank you for your time. Okay, the next speaker is Jackie Cotta followed by Kate Fisher. Thank you. 
Um, uh, it is unfortunate to see the city of Livermore leadership in all areas making decisions to destroy the city and community by siding with Marxist agendas. Uh, the, um, I'm sorry, it skipped out. Uh, these days, many people are beginning to ask and search questions about the COVID-19 pandemic and why. Perhaps it's because thousands of frontline doctors and nurses are being threatened for speaking out. Effective treatments are being withheld from the public while poorly tested vaccines are being rushed into production with strong hints that they could be made mandatory. Or is it because some of the COVID-19 vaccines are manufactured using technologies that have never been used before in vaccines or mass distribution? or that early testing has produced 100% side effects or even death. Mainstream journalism has become a travesty. They should be covering these stories, but they have mostly become participants in the official policy of censoring objective science, scientific inquiry. People who are asking intelligent questions, doing their homework, and questioning official truths are being labeled conspiracy theorists, and worse, are being fired from their jobs, cursed, censored, and deplatformed from the internet. Unconventional viewpoints are similarly dismissed without cause, while our young people are being taught that censorship is not only acceptable, but is laudable, especially if it is considered offensive to someone. There are many indications that the COVID-19 pandemic is being used as an excuse to bring in worldwide police state. With lockdowns and rampant censorship, our cherished freedoms are being flushed down the memory hole in the name of staying safe, while our media remain complicit. We thought it was time to start um, to discussing this and I thought I'd bring it to your attention that your mask mandates and our city council has pl been playing along with this travesty for months. They've never once asked the health officials for data with regard to why it is that they went from counting the deaths to cases, which mean absolutely nothing, for a virus that has a 99.9% .9 survival rate. It is unfortunate that this council hasn't done their homework but instead has chosen to fine the community members for not wearing deadly masks that are very, very dangerous for people to wear. And they don't stop a virus from spreading as seen by the Danish study that was released in November. And they have never gone back to ask the health officer the questions such as, do you have proof that restaurants, bars, and salons are spreading a virus. And not only that, this virus is not as deadly as you're saying. Thank you. The next speaker is Kate Fisher. Hi, my name is Tim Twitty. This is my wife's uh, profile. And uh, I just wanted to start off by saying, I think there's a lot of great things happening in Livermore. We're developing our downtown. We are uh, coming to a place where the city just is accepting of a lot of people. Uh, the reason I'm talking today is about the empty property on First and Second Street, uh, right next to the townhouse buildings. I live in the Palisade, and it's become a safety issue and a hazard having an empty lot there. Uh, I walk my dog and I see people walking their children and there's a lot of break-ins in cars now, a lot of glass, a lot of garbage, just all lined up along First Street. And, you know, while a lot of people are worried about, you know, beautifying downtown and everything else, this is really just a matter of safety in order for people to walk downtown safe or walk back to their home safe. Uh, occasionally they will trim some bushes in there however it's just not enough and something needs to be done about the property uh, as far as i knew I, rumor is it's owned by the bank heads which we have a beautiful theater and we just need to take care of their other property the same way we take care of uh, our theater so i don't want to take up too much time uh, i think there's a lot of things that livermore is doing well i actually appreciate the fact that we're enforcing masks downtown being that my wife's in healthcare. And uh, we're, you know, we're in a state where we all need to come together as one to kind of fight this and get back to a spot where we can enjoy downtown and enjoy outdoor dining and uh, build in the future. So, but something needs to be done about this field because we're beautifying our city. We're doing harm by having a, a hazard on a corner in such a city. And that's it. And that concludes the speakers. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much for your input. And uh, rest assured, we have been listening to what was said and the appropriate uh, city staff member or other items will, um, other people will, will be taking action uh, as needed on these things. Uh, if you have uh, items, for instance, a neighborhood preservation or something, there is a path to submit uh, uh, complaints or observations directly into the uh, city. Uh, city manager, could you just let people know how that's done? So um, if you go onto our website uh, and actually look up neighborhood preservation, there is a, a, a place to submit um, direct comments, uh, an email uh, address or um, phone numbers for neighborhood preservation as well. So simply go to the website, type in neighborhood preservation, um, it'll take you right to it. Okay, thank you. And uh, with that concludes uh, Citizens Forum. And now I'd like to uh, turn to the consent calendar. Are there any items that the um, city council members would like to pull for discussion? Um, I was, I can ask uh, Mark Roberts if this is an appropriate item to pull or to discuss. Are we allowed to discuss the items without pulling them? Um, item 4.4. If you have questions about item 4.4, we can certainly respond to those. Okay, are there, uh, before we go into detail, are there any other items that people would like to uh, discuss? Okay, and I'd also like to, at this point, find out, do we have any um, uh, public comment on the consent calendar? Mayor, no comment has, has been received. Okay, well, with that, uh, let's uh, uh, discuss the item that Council Member Kick would like to do that. And then uh, you can answer the, uh, the questions. And then with that, we can then proceed with the entire calendar. Okay, great. Um, so item 4.4 is the Vasco Road widening. Um, I wanted to talk about it a little bit because the project could have the potential um, to conflict with the goals of the Climate Action Plan update, which we'll be talking about later in the meeting. Um, and so I wanted to ask a couple questions of our development director. Um, community Development Director to see if I understand the, the goals of this project. Um, so Paul Spence, um, from my current understanding, the project is meant to lower residential cut through traffic um, from families going out of their way to not sit in that traffic on Vasco to get to the middle and elementary school on the east side of Vasco. Would that be a correct observation? Yes, uh, Councilmember Kick, that is correct. The intent is really to move the pinch point a little farther north so that traffic can flow more freely within the community. People can get to and from schools and other errands. Okay, so um, there is um, potential that this could increase vehicle miles traveled, which is something generally climate action plans uh, would like to decrease. Um, but from my understanding, we need to move forward on the project before we get that environmental impact and vehicle miles traveled report. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, we will be doing, if the council authorizes the action tonight, we will be working uh, with our consulting engineers and preparing studies. We'll be doing uh, an environmental impact analysis of this project. But um, just on the surface, we don't expect significant greenhouse gas impacts. You really are helping to reduce congestion from local trips it really won't change uh, commute trips on Vasco overall. Okay, fantastic. So the last thing was, because we're already tearing up this road, um, I think it would be a good idea to, um, since the goal is to increase efficiency of travel for families specifically from those schools um, throughout the neighborhood, um, to look at the bike and pedestrian improvements that are already on the docket um, in our active transportation plan and see if it's a good time to fit those in at the same time. We're already gonna be tearing up the road. I'm thinking very specifically about the Vasco crossing on Garaventa Road, that uh, Garaventa Ranch Road, how it would then turns into Overlake on the other side of Vasco. Um, that crossing is the most obvious spot that we could look at improvement. So if that's something that we could do, um, let the engineers know as we're already moving forward potentially, um, please consider looking at those bike ped projects and then let us know um, if any of those make sense to do at the same time. Yes, thank you. That's a great suggestion. We will uh, absolutely take a look at 
both Vasco itself and then uh, intersection crossings of Vasco, such as Garavanda Ranch Road. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, discussion. I think that's the right thing to be thinking about. Uh, with that, uh, any other items that want to be discussed or can I have a motion? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Okay, Mo uh, moved and seconded the consent calendar. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Cake? Aye. Councilmember Carly? Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe? Aye. Mayor Warner? Aye. Okay, uh, we're now on to um, public hearings. Uh, and this is the first one's uh, regarding a street uh, name change. Uh, can we have the um, staff report on that, please? Good evening, Honorable Mayor. It's Mark Roberts, your city manager. And I'm going to introduce our project manager for uh, this project, assistant planner, Cam Purewall. Good evening, Mayor Warner and city council members. Um, are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. The project for your review tonight is a subdivision amendment to allow a street name change from Comcast Place to Triad Place. <clears throat> Comcast Place is located north of North Canyons Parkway, west of Collier Canyon Road, and east of Independence Drive. Comcast, um, in 2009, Comcast Corporation signed a lease for all three buildings on the site. The original street name, Triad Drive, was changed to Comcast Place in 2009. Comcast leased all three buildings on the site, and in 2020, Comcast Corporation recently consolidated their office space from all three buildings. The building at 3077 Comcast Place will now be vacant. The applicant is requesting a name change to Triad Place, which is similar to its originally approved name. This will enable the applicant to advertise the vacant building with a more conventional street name. Changing the name to Triad Place provides consistency on the northern and southern portions of the street along North, North Canyons Parkway and provides a neutral identity for the office park. Staff has reviewed the proposed street name change to Triad Place and has found it consistent with the city's street naming policy established in City Council Resolution 372-91. The project is also consistent with the general plan circulation element. All required agencies have reviewed and approved the proposed street name change. The City Council has the authority to approve a street name change after public hearings by the Planning Commission and City Council. The Planning Commission reviewed the proposed street name change on November 17th, 2020, and voted unanimously 4-0 and recommended approval. All property owners with direct access off the subject street have agreed to the proposed street name change, and that is provided as attachment five in your packets. <clears throat> in conclusion, Planning Commission and staff recommend the City Council and instruct staff to file the notice of exemption with the Alameda County Clerk and approve subdivision amendment subject to the attached conditions of approval. And that concludes staff's presentation. Staff and the applicant, Josh Burdick with Align Real Estate are available for any questions council may have. Thank you. Okay, are there any uh, questions from the council at this point? Uh, do we have any um, public uh, comment on this? Mayor, no comment has been received. All right, uh, can I get a motion? I'll move the item. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Kick? Aye. Councilmember Carling? Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe? Aye. Mayor Warner? Aye. Passes unanimously. Now we're on to matters for consideration. 6.1, the uh, oral report from the Director of Emergency Services regarding the COVID-19 emergency. Good evening. I think that's our city manager, right? It is indeed. Good evening, Honorable Mayor uh, and members of the City Council. Uh, this is Mark Roberts, your city manager and your Director of Emergency Services. 
I wanted to this evening um, give you an update on some of our numbers, um, our progress on vaccination, um, and then also uh, give you a little bit of information on state and federal uh, initiatives. Uh, in addition, later in the agenda, um, you have an item on your agenda for further um, local incentive programs, um, and we'll talk about those at that point. So starting off with our numbers, um, as of today, um, Alameda County has 60,347 uh, cumulative cases of COVID um, and 736 deaths which have been attributed to um, COVID-19. In Livermore, um, our count at this particular point is 3,091 and we have 34 deaths that have occurred uh, within the city or from city residents uh, as it uh, relates to COVID-19. Um, like uh, the entire state, um, Livermore and Alameda County have been uh, impacted significantly by this latest wave of uh, COVID increases. In fact, our case rates um, in the county are more than 30 cases, um, uh, 35.5 cases, um, and Livermore's cases uh, per 100,000, those are cases per 100,000, um, are about at that same rate, just a hair above the, the 35 uh, level. Um, those numbers are dramatically different than they were just a couple of months ago. Um, as you heard earlier in the presentation, um, we had uh, we were in the red zone uh, in early November, um, and at that time, our total case counts uh, per day per hundred thousand um, were about 3.5. Um, so we are now uh, having about 10 times the number of cases per day, both in Livermore and throughout Alameda County. Um, the uh, state uh, framework um, for moving us through this current um, period involves looking at several factors. Um, one of those factors is um, hospital ICU bed uh, availability. Um, when uh, the four week projection for ICU capacity drops below 15%, um, additional restrictions um, are in place. And of course, those uh, went into place in December in the state. Um, uh, and uh, Alameda County uh, impl implemented those uh, requirements just before we crossed over into the state mandated area. Um, we currently countywide have just above 3% um, availability in our ICU beds, um, far below the 15% threshold. Um, and although that is uh, significant and very concerning, um, we are, however, doing significantly better than our neighbors um, to the east. Um, San Joaquin County um, continues to have an ICU bed capacity very close to or at zero, and they have begun the process of diverting their most serious, some of their most serious patients to surrounding areas, which includes Alameda County. Um, and so um, throughout the Bay Area, um, we are impacted by um, the various levels of ICU uh, capacity um, in each of the counties uh, that are adjacent to us. And under state direction, um, the hospital system in the state does work as a single unit um, and hospitals within those areas that do have uh, bed capacity are required to take um, ICU patients from those in surrounding areas. So we're in a very serious time um, as far as the case counts. Um, a tiny bit of good news is um, in the last couple of weeks, um, the increase has leveled off. Um, so we are not getting worse um, for a number of weeks uh, through December. Um, the number of cases were increasing dramatically. Um, so at this point, we appear to be leveling off somewhat, um, which, is, uh, which is good news. Um, currently, uh, locally, um, our Stanford Valley Care uh, case, uh, case count census are that we have um, 52 uh, open beds at Stanford Valley Care. So locally, we uh, still do have capacity, um, which is very good. Um, and as I noted before, the Bay Area capacity overall, um, as of uh, today, is 3% uh, open ICU beds. Um, on the uh, good news front, um, vaccinations uh, have started within the county of Alameda. Um, we are uh, within uh, phase one of a phase a four phase um, vaccine prioritization framework. The CDC um, working with states uh, came up with a four phase uh, priority system um, for um, who gets vaccines and in what order. Um, so the phases one, two, and three, and four are further subdivided um, based on essentially the criteria that was included in the CDC framework. 
So we are currently um, in a case or a section 1A, so phase 1A, and that includes healthcare workers, community healthcare workers, and long-term care facility residents and staff. Um, the reason for that is um, that uh, uh, for those members of the public in long-term uh, care facilities, they've had the highest mortality um, due to COVID-19, so they have been prioritized. So healthcare workers include um, some of our first responders, all of our paramedics and EMTs are considered uh, healthcare workers for that process. And so our Livermore Pleasanton Fire Department uh, staff um, have uh, all received their first vaccination and most of them now have received their second vaccination. So that's very good news that those folks who are out there um, having to perform medical services in the community every day um, are now just completing their vaccination. And then of course, over time, um, the effectiveness of that vaccination does improve um, after, and that's a, consistent with all sorts of vaccines, um, your immunity grows over a period of time after that second vaccination. Um, we still have several thousand more members of that particular uh, phase 1A um, to accomplish within Alameda County. And then we'll move on to phase 1B and the most notable group, it includes a, a range of group uh, folks, including essential workers, um, residents more than 75 years old, um, those who are incarcerated, car incarcerated or unhoused. Um, we continue to have the uh, highest mortality um, from those who are 70 or older. Um, those who are 80 or older um, have uh, extreme mortality from COVID-19. Although our greatest number of infections now uh, is in uh, our age group 20 to 40. Um, and uh, even though um, most of those, the vast majority of those uh, survive in those younger age frames, um, there are uh, at times significant side effects uh, that appear to be long lasting. So we're concerned about those infections as well. Um, phase 1C of the vaccination uh, program includes essentially uh, governmental operation staff, um, adults essentially 65 uh, and older at that point, and uh, people aged 16 to 64 who have significantly higher uh, risk of underlying health conditions. Um, after that, we have phases 2, 3, and 4 um, to get the remainder of the population vaccinated. Um, we have been told by Alameda County that we will move through phase one. They're hoping uh, essentially the rest of January and early February. Um, we uh, continue to sort of work with and monitor um, that with the county. Um, we are working with our partners in uh, Pleasanton and Dublin uh, and Stanford Valley Care um, to explore uh, utilizing the testing site at the fairgrounds for a regional vaccination center. Most people, of course, will use their healthcare provider to get their vaccinations or um, other points of vaccination, um, such as uh, Walgreens or CVS um, uh, also provide vaccinations once you're uh, in the criteria that is appropriate for vaccination. Um, and um, adding uh, regional facilities and uh, perhaps local facilities is also part of the mix. The county has asked the city to explore um, a local vaccination center. So we are in the process of working with the county um, to uh, work through what the requirements of that would be. And I will keep you updated on that process as well. We wanna make sure that as vac uh, vaccine is available, that our residents um, are able to get vaccinated um, as quickly as possible. And with that, I am available for uh, questions. Of course, we do have an item related to um, the uh, uh, update on our incentive program. And at that time, uh, Adam Vandewater will be giving us a little bit of information about our state and federal uh, uh, economic programs um, that are moving through their individual processes there uh, to provide help to both residents and businesses within the community. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I see uh, Council Member Carling has his hand up. Yes, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, regarding the uh, phases, and particularly 1B, how will, how will particularly residents that aren't essential workers but are over 75, how will they know that we are in 1B? And another question is, how will they be notified? I think they're, I've had some correspondence with folks that are in that age group, and they, they're concerned that their time will come and they won't know about it. And so how do you know, first of all, how will we, either the state or the county or Livermore, know we're in 1B and how would a person over 75 be notified? Okay, 
So um, your local city staff is going to help with that with our social media and pushing information out. But the definitive way to know um, is to actually go to Alameda County um, Health Department's website. Um, and on that website, um, you'll scroll down, scroll down, there's a number of different sections in it, and one of them is vaccines. Um, and in that section, it does tell you um, what phase we're in, and that's your absolute best way to get there. Um, so from that perspective, uh, that's the primary. And then um, we do continue to expect uh, that the news media will uh, locally will continue to track what phase we are in. We're seeing only a little bit of activity on that front right now because the general public is not um, uh, generally being reached out to. But as we move through the rest of phase one and then into phases two, three, and four, um, we expect that to become you know, essentially part of your nightly news feed or a program, depending on how you get your news. But the best way is to go right to the website and we'll, um, we'll point people in that direction from our website as well. Good, thank you. Vice Mayor Monroe. Right, uh, so I was actually a very similar question and I, th I think you actually addressed it. It was simply uh, checking it on our own website and making sure that the information was there. Um, and I think you just told me it was. And we'll continue to update that as the circumstances change. I don't know where my, my hand okay. is, but I'm just going <laughs> to, that's okay. Um, do we um, have an update about um, how we will inform and work with the unhoused population once we get to that point? Obviously, their access to news um, might be different than um, a housed population. It is, and so we will be working with our nonprofit uh, providers. Um, we do, as you know, of course, have staff who are out um, uh, among the unhoused uh, every day, our housing, uh, our um, homeless liaison officers in the police department, um, our partners from Access and others um, are uh, out in the groups each day. We'll also be coordinating with the county, um, who is at this point contemplating um, targeted uh, inoculation centers um, targeted at the homeless population, so coming to them and helping that process. Um, in addition, of course, a number of our formerly uh, unhoused population are now uh, taking uh, advantage of several of the programs that have um, been funded by the state and implemented by the county. And of course, those folks are in a more stable uh, environment and will get information um, as a part of that. Um, but we will be reaching out through our nonprofit providers, our own staff, and then working with the county on directed inoculation. Okay, I've got a uh, couple of questions, suggestions. You, uh, you know, at the beginning gave some uh, numbers and uh, particularly the uh, mortality rate. I don't think that's on our website at the moment, is it? That's correct. We do not, we, while we have cases, we don't have total number of deaths. And it may be worth adding that uh, just in the sense that you hear people making comments that, you know, it's much lower than it is or whatever. So that could be helpful. But I thought some of the other uh, report outs that you had on the ICU capacity, I don't think that's on the website either, is it? That's a great question. That actually is directly on the county's website um, on their front page there, but I don't believe it's on ours. I would just suggest that if we could add a couple of key numbers that, that I just mentioned there, that would might be uh, helpful as, as well. So, but thank you for that. Uh, report. Are there, uh, at this point, do we have any um, public comment with respect to this item? City Clerk's Office, please unmute attendees who would like to speak. The speaker that we have is Jackie Cotta. I spent 20 minutes on the phone with Nicholas Moss. He's the interim health officer for Alameda County. And he told me that cases mean absolutely nothing. He told me also that he has no proof and no data that shows that restaurants, bars, salons, or any of the businesses that he has decided to shut down are any of the areas where they are keeping data that, that, that uh, COVID-19 is being spread. They are not calculating that information. I have asked the city council to ask him this over and over again. It is once again proof that this 
is absolutely propaganda. I also asked him about the IC, ICU bed capacity. The 3% is only pertaining to one hospital. It is not pertaining to the entire county. So once again, the lies are being spread. Why? Because the agenda is to destroy the economy. It is not for health. There is no reason for us to keep our businesses shut down. And not only that, it is no different than any other flu season. So it is absolutely ridiculous that we are housing this information on the city website. There's no reason for it. We have it everywhere. It is put in our face all day long. It's on every single news cycle in the Bay Area. It's in every single commercial. It's all over the city. We can't get away from it and we are tired of it. There is nothing different in this flu season than there has been in last flu season and the flu season beforehand. COVID is just the flu that can turn into pneumonia just like any other season. I'm sure you all have seen the letter that was written by the three doctors in San Ramon. And guess what? One of those doctors was fired. Why, do we ask? Why is it that the corrupt health agencies are hell-bent on censoring the information? Why is it that our city leaders in Livermore don't take the opportunity to dig deeper into the information. Once again, cases mean nothing for a virus that has a 99.9% .9 survival rate. It is absolutely disgusting that you people focus on finding businesses that want to be open, that want to save their livelihood, that want to employ their employees, and that want to pay their bills, and that you fine people for not wearing a mask and that you side with the corrupt tyrannical governments. Okay, do we have any other uh, public comment on this item? No, Mayor, that was the last speaker. Okay, we'll move on to item 6.3. The um, now on to the uh, financial relief efforts. Are you um, meaning to reorder the agenda? Oh, no, I, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but uh, we probably should have. But anyway, I, I had to scroll to the wrong place. I meant 6.2, the uh, Climate Action Plan update. Very good, Honorable Mayor, Mark Roberts, your City Manager, and I would like to introduce Associate Planner, uh, Trisha Pontau, who's gonna lead us through the update for our 2020 Climate Action Plan. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so we've been working on our updating our climate action plan for about a year now, so we wanted to check in and show you all what we've been working on. Uh, for a little bit of background, we have a climate change element in our general plan that was adopted back in 2009, and it called for the adoption of a climate, climate action plan. So our existing climate action plan was adopted in 2012, and it covers climate mitigation, so reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the city, and I'm pleased to report we met the reduction goal that we set for ourselves in our um, existing plan. And that was through a combination of local, regional, and state efforts. And so now there are some new state requirements for local climate action planning. Um, the state now requires that cities consider climate adaptation or how a city will prepare for the impacts of climate change. And the state has already has also established some new statewide GHG reduction targets. So that's kind of driving the the um, update for our climate action plan, which Council instructed us to do. And we uh, and they approved a contract with the Rincon Consultants in January of 2020 of 2020. And you'll hear from Brian Gardner from Rincon Consultants after my presentation. So the 2020 Climate Action Plan scope has essentially four components. The first is the mitigation, so continuing to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the city. And then the new adaptation component, which is preparing Livermore for the projected climate change impacts that we are expected to experience. Uh, the third is engagement. So obviously the point of this plan is to help maintain the health and well-being of our community. So we want them involved with this plan and get feedback from them. And then the fourth is the implementation plan. So 
what are we going to do? How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to stay on track to make sure we're meeting our goals? So the past year has been focused a lot on the mitigation and adaptation components, a lot of te technical analyses that Ryan will get into later, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our engagement that we're working on. We're gearing up to kick off a bunch of uh, community outreach. So um, one of the first things we did was to get our citizens advisory committee on board. So we have a climate action plan advisory committee that was appointed by city council. It's 11 members of Livermore residents who meet on the first Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. The meetings are open to the public. Anyone's um, allowed to participate. And we've got a really, really passionate and engaged group. Um, and they so far have been reviewing some background information, reviewing the technical analyses I mentioned. And Currently, they are starting to refine their list of recommended strategies to include in the Climate Action Plan. And then we also have our technical advisory group, which is a, an internal staff group made up of various city divisions and departments. And we're checking in with them at key milestones throughout the project to make sure that we're coordinating and consistent with the other efforts going around in our other divisions. We also, at the beginning of the project, released um, a quick community survey. Um, we were a couple weeks into the first lockdown and we weren't sure if climate action planning was something that the community was gonna wanna, want to engage on or uh, was important for the city to even undertake. So we put out a quick community survey and did find that 76% of the respondents still thought it was important for the city to act on climate change. And we're using some of the information that came out of that survey to help inform our future outreach efforts. So we did see underrepresentation from youth. So we have geared up a lot of student outreach. We've been giving presentations to Junction Avenue and Livermore High School science and engineering students. And we're working to get on our Youth Advisory Commission agenda for an upcoming meeting. And we've asked some of the same questions uh, of the students that we had in the community survey and 80% of them said it was still important for the city to act on climate change. So it seems like it's still an important topic for the city to be working on. Um, we are the next big engagement opportunity we have is our online open house. We obviously would have loved to have an in-person open house event, but that isn't possible right now. So we've transitioned it over to the project website. The materials will be available starting this week and then um, people can check in on them, walk through them at their leisure, answer questions, leave comments in the different sections. So there'll be sections for our greenhouse gas emissions, our, the vulnerability analysis, the benefits of addressing climate change, some of the broader strategies the city might Im implement to address climate change. Um, and then after people have time, have had time to look through that information and we are having a live Zoom event on January 28th. Really casual drop in, anyone can drop in anytime between five to 7 p.m. and we'll, the project team will be there to talk to people more about the project and their recommendations for what we should have in the plan. And then once our advisory committee has finished refining our draft measures list, we'll go back out to the community again with a public workshop and some targeted stakeholder fo focus groups to get more feedback on that draft measures list. Um, another thing I wanted to tell you guys about tonight uh, is really cool. We were approached by Google, I think back in 2019, and they told us they were adding Livermore to their Environmental Insights Explorer tool. So this is available online right now. Anyone can go to Google and type in Environmental Insights Explorer and search for Livermore, and it'll bring up this interactive map where they've put a bunch of data together about our emissions from buildings and transportation. And you can go in and explore the data and tweak it and see what inter different interventions might do to our emissions. They've also added another layer for rooftop solar potential. So this slide, I zoomed into our Civic Center campus here and you can see it shows you where there's more rooftop solar potential and you can do this for any building in the city. Um, and we are working on a, a couple other tools with them that are not available yet. They're in production. The first is an air quality tool. So this is an example from London where essentially the Google street view cars drive around the streets with air quality monitors on attached to the vehicles and they're taking measurements as they drive around the city. 
So we'll have something soon similar for Livermore where we'll be able to identify kind of hot spots of bad air quality throughout the city and that will help us inform our decision, our decisions moving forward. And then the final tool that they're working on is an urban forestry tool. We are the second city after Los Angeles to get this tool. So we're um, it's pretty pretty cool. If you're if you're zoomed out in the tool, you can see kind of regular relative to other areas in the city who has better tree canopy cover versus who doesn't. And then as you zoom in on the tool, you can actually see where each tree is and the, the canopy cover. So again, this having data, spatial data and tools like this will be really helpful for us making decisions moving forward for our climate action goals. Uh, and then quickly, I just wanted to touch on the schedule before I turn it over to Ryan. Again, we've been working on this for about a year now. So council adopted the contract and scope at the beginning of 2020. We got to work working on our technical analyses and getting our advisory committee up and running. And then the committee was reviewing some of those materials, providing recommendations on our new reduction targets. And now they are hard at work refining their draft measures list. Um, and then we'll be heading out to the community to get feedback on everything we've been working on. And then we'll wrap everything up into the draft plan over the summer, then go back out, get further feedback on the draft plan before getting it back to you by the end of the year for adoption. So that is it from me. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan Gardner from RENCON and I have to share his slides, I think. So give me one second. Okay, can you see these slides now? That looks good. Trisha, can you hear me all right? Yep, I can hear you great. Perfect, thank you. All right, yeah, so <clears throat> my name is Ryan Gardner. I'm the um, Climate Action Planning Program Manager at Rincon Consultants, and I've been helping out uh, Trisha and Andy and other city staff in working on the Climate Action Plan, um, and today, um, go to the next slide. I'll give kind of a rundown of what we've done so far. Um, we'll cover the 2017 greenhouse gas inventory results, talk about the forecast and some of the proposed targets that we have um, developed in conjunction with the KPAC. Um, then we'll talk a bit about the climate action plan and, and how those targets are gonna be met and then get into some of the areas that we've been discussing around mitigation measures and adaptation measures. Um, as Trisha mentioned, we're still working through these um, measures and actions, but are kind of starting to focus in on some key areas and we'll kind of cover those today um, and then move on to some of the next steps. Next slide. Okay, so to get us started, um, the first thing we do is conduct a greenhouse gas inventory of our, our most recent year. So this is uh, a pie graph showing the sources of emissions in Livermore. Um, kind of the first thing that jumps out here is that big 55% um, of the light blue. That is emissions from on-road transportation. Um, that includes all of our passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles, um, semi-trucks, all of that, that are, are kind of driving on our roads. Um, and then another big area is the kind of um, brown and dark blue um, sections that are 12 and 10%. Those make up our natural gas usage. So um, non-residential, which is commercial and light industrial, and then residential gas. Um, the dark gray, 10%, kind of on the top left side is off-road transportation. So that <clears throat> is construction equipment, um, lawn equipment, things that are burning fuel, um, gasoline and diesel, but are not on roadways. And then the rest of the sections are 
um, electricity predominantly, and then waste and water and wastewater. Um, and you can move on to the next slide. So once we had our 2017 inventory together, we then did what we call a, <clears throat> a business as usual forecast. And that's the, the top graph there. And really what this does is it looks at and tries to project what greenhouse gas emissions in Livermore would do if we stayed the same as we were today, but continued to grow. So everyone kind of used the same technologies and drove the same vehicles, um, but more people were added to the city. So as you can see, those emissions increase over time. And then from that, we take away emissions um, <clears throat> based on state, local, um, and federal regulations. And that's our adjusted forecast. So <clears throat> that is a more kind of clear picture of what emissions are expected to do over time um, and how state regulations like SB 100, which is 100% uh, carbon-free electricity by 2045, um, and advanced clean cars and other regulations are kind of projected to change our emissions. So you can see that we do get a decrease over time um, and that kind of flattens out around 2035 since that is the sunset data of most of the current regulations. Um, so we get a decrease, but not quite enough to hit um, the state targets. So move on to the next slide. So the current state targets that we're talking about are Senate Bill 32, which requires a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, this is the next bill after AB 32, which was a return to 1990 levels by 2020, which um, as Trisha mentioned, the city has met that goal um, along with the state. So that's great news. Um, and then the second, uh, executive order, not a Senate bill, hasn't been codified yet, um, but it looks like where California is kind of moving in this direction is achieving a target of carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, so these, <clears throat> these laws are important because in order to develop a qualified greenhouse gas reduction plan, which means we can streamline um, CEQA develop or streamline off of the cap uh, for new development, we need to show consistency with these state targets. So they're kind of the, the minimum reductions that we need to address in our climate action plan. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> working with the KPAC and city staff, um, we went to work looking at what a greenhouse gas reduction um, target pathway would look like for the city of Livermore. We went through quite a few options, um, but have landed on a proposed linear reduction to carbon neutrality by 2045 on a per capita basis. And what this means is essentially we've drawn a, a straight line from where we are in 2017 to zero in 2045. But we're looking at this um, on emissions per capita. So taking the total emissions for the, for the city and dividing by the population. And what this does is allows us to be a little more flexible over time and take population growth into account. So we're not penalized for growing, but rather incentivizing more efficient systems overall. Um, so this is the, the proposed target um, and we'll get into next a little bit how we're gonna meet these targets. Go to the next slide. So in this climate action plan, we're really gonna be focused on um, looking at out through 2030. This cap is likely not going to have all the measures we need to get to carbon neutrality in 2045, and that's, that's okay. We really need to show <clears throat> that we're making substantial progress towards these goals, and then show that, that we're a quantifiable reduction to me, at least that 40% reduction from 1990 levels. Um, the city's goal that we've proposed so far um, is slightly more aggressive than the state target. And what that will hopefully allow us to do um, is to make some solid progress up front. So it's more of a, a consistent reduction throughout 2045 rather than less reduction through 2030 and then ramping up with a much more aggressive reduction post 2030. So this would kind of be a more 
consistent reduction over time. Um, hopefully making it easier to meet those long-term carbon neutrality goals by starting to make decisions about infrastructure and, and kind of long-term um, building that might impact our ability later on. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So <clears throat> next I'll, I'll kind of go through um, some of the key sectors and strategies and then some of the actions that we've been discussing for greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and again, these are, are preliminary and we're still kind of working through the quantification of each of these and we'll be doing more outreach specifically around um, the more final measures and actions once they're produced by the KPAC and city staff. Um, so the first sector <clears throat> that has a lot of potential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions is buildings and um, one of the kind of major strategies that we're looking at is electrification. Uh, you may have heard there's kind of been a big push through California to limit or ban new development of natural gas or new infrastructure of natural gas and new development. Um, 45 or so cities have adopted these ordinances um, to keep natural gas out of new development that kind of tries to get at that 22, 24% of emissions um, that are currently coming from natural gas. And this is being driven in large part by SB100, which is 100% renewable electricity, or sorry, carbon-free electricity by 2045. Um, so <clears throat> as we electrify things, buildings, vehicles, um, those emissions are gonna decrease to zero by 2045. So it's really, a key strategy for achieving carbon neutrality. There's also um, more reports that <clears throat> natural gas prices are expected to increase in the future um, and <clears throat> insulating us from those cost increases by building with electric, all electric in the uh, short term is looking more and more like a, a long-term cost benefit. Um, as well, building all electric up front based on the new state studies for our climate zone show that um, we'll see both upfront savings and new construction um, as well as long-term on-bill savings. With existing buildings, we're really starting to look at um, kind of more voluntary actions up front and then moving to more mandatory items over time uh, once costing and things like that are better understood. We'll go to the next slide. So some of the actions that we've been discussing um, is adopting an electrification ordinance to require all electric new construction in um, buildings that are cost effective. Um, that's currently low and mid-rise residential and uh, most or all uh, commercial building types. Another is opting up to East Bay Community Choice Energy um, for electricity accounts to the 100% carbon free or renewable option by 2025. This would again, reduce all of our electricity emissions to zero, um, as well as any um, electricity or anything we move from a natural gas or um, fossil fuel fuel source over to electricity, those would also go to zero. So it's kind of a, a multiplier um, action. And then <clears throat> looking at phasing in electrification for existing buildings, with voluntary efforts, um, incentives, and then looking at more mandatory requirements over time. And next slide. So <clears throat> the next strategy that we're looking at is mobility. So VMT or vehicles miles traveled um, reduction is the first way that we can reduce emissions from the transportation sector. Um, Unlike buildings where we can kind of have a direct effect over the types of buildings that are being built through ordinances and the green building code, um, VMT is, is a little bit more tricky. So we're, we need to look at both carrots and sticks in order to get the behavioral change that we're hoping to have. Um, so some of the strategies we're looking at is improving bike and pedestrian infrastructure, um, improving shared mobility, and looking at ways to improve transit. Um, also looking at <clears throat> kind of coupling those carrots or, or better infrastructure with some sticks. So some um, things to dissuade people from driving single occupancy vehicles as much. And those could be 
um, parking reductions or parking maximums for new development rather than minimums, transit-oriented um, development requirements or transportation demand management requirements, um, and then even dynamic pricing or pricing in general for um, parking places. The other side of this mobility strategy is electrification of vehicles. So again, we can't, um, we can't require electric vehicles to be used, but we can kind of start to prepare for this, this switch that's going to happen. Um, we're already seeing state legislation requiring um, the sale of electric vehicles by 2035. Um, so we're just going to be looking at ways to prepare for this shift and make sure that people have the infrastructure they need to, to make the switch to electric vehicles. Um, next slide, please. So some of the strategies we're looking at here um, are EV charging ordinances for new construction, uh, making sure that we're <clears throat> not wiring or necessarily installing um, chargers, but making sure new construction has the um, conduit in place so that we can cost effectively run wires later on. Um, it's pretty expensive <clears throat> after a building is developed to add this infrastructure, uh, usually like two to three thousand dollars, where upfront during construction it's only two or three hundred dollars. So kind of an order of magnitude different there. Also looking at opportunities for partnered installation of public charging stations or public public private partnerships. Um, which will allow the city to increase the number of EV charging stations in town um, without having to pay for those fully out of pocket. Looking at parking meter rates and dynamic rates um, in certain portions of the city and some of those revenues can be put into some of our more expensive options which are like bicycle and pedestrian um, and trails uh, infrastructure, especially those outlined in the Trails Active Transportation Plan or the Active Transportation Plan. Uh, next one, please. Um, and then also we've got waste, um, not as big of a sector as <clears throat> the other two that we talked about with buildings and mobility, but there is quite a few opportunities here. Um, our primary focus in waste is going to be removing organics from the waste stream. Um, <clears throat> SB 1383, is a, a pretty stringent state requirement that has been passed down to reduce um, organics in the waste stream by 75% um, by 2025 from 2014 levels. And so we're gonna be really be focusing on this kind of composting organics diversion, which makes up a majority of the emissions in the waste stream. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So in order to do this, we're looking at increasing our composting capacity, um, potentially looking at compostable foodware ordinances, um, also front of house composting ordinances to make sure that there is compost um, available at you know, coffee shops and other places where um, you're kind of busing your own table. Um, so again, trying to increase the ability of us to divert that organic content from the waste stream um, and then also working on edible food recovery. So this is kind of before things become food waste, making sure that any edible food gets diverted from the landfill um, and goes to food recovery services, uh, food banks and things like that. So I think there's a goal of about 20% um, increase in that uh, edible food recovery on that side. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, um, we're also looking at carbon sequestration opportunities. Um, <clears throat> this, all the other kind of emission sources are, could be considered positive emissions. So um, things that are increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Carbon sequestration on the other hand is reducing those emissions. So it's pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it um, either in natural um, biomass like trees and bushes and things like that, or um, more on the technology side, capturing that, those emissions and storing them underground um, and keeping them out of atmosphere that way. And our, our KPAC group is really interesting. Um, some of the folks from the Lawrence Livermore lab are, are really 
interested in this carbon capture technology. And that's going to be one of the kind of interesting defining uh, pieces of this cap compared to a lot of other cities is looking more deeply into how the city can um, use technology to capture some of this carbon and even start to think about what a carbon negative future might look like, um, where you could sequester more carbon um, than, than you're emitting potentially. Next slide. So as part of this, um, we'll be looking at implementing and kind of expanding on the urban forest revitalization program um, in conjunction with the map that Trisha showed with the tree canopy coverage, um, looking at places where we can plant more trees, increase carbon sequestration, and then also hit on some of the resiliency pieces that I'll talk about next. Um, and then, like I said, looking at some other kind of new technologies um, that we can potentially implement later on, on top of these kind of more natural um, sequestration processes. Next slide, please. So that kind of covers the high level strategies that we're looking at for <clears throat> the vulnerability now, or sorry, for the mitigation measures. Um, so next I'll move into kind of our adaptation. Um, what are we gonna do about the climate changes that we're already going to see or already seeing um, and expect to see more of? So just like we start that process, uh, the mitigation process with a greenhouse gas inventory, we started our uh, adaptation process with a vulnerability analysis to better understand what the changes in Livermore are expected to look like. Um, the results of that kind of briefly, we expect to see both maximum and minimum temperatures increase in the near term. Um, and that's with a really high certainty. So our, we're expecting to see more heat waves, um, <clears throat> more days above 100 degrees, um, and more extreme heat days. And then on the precipitation side, <clears throat> we're expecting to see a lot more variability um, and intensity. And this means that instead of kind of consistent rains through the winter, we'll have longer dry spells um, with more extreme rain events, um, kind of more stochastic, uh, high precipitation events that really is gonna change how much water is available. Um, it's gonna be a lot harder to store that water. Um, and we're also expecting to see kind of statewide less water stored as snow, which decreases water availability in general. And then finally, um, wildfire risks in, in and around Livermore. Um, we're not expecting to see a lot more wildfire in Livermore, but as we saw this year, <clears throat> wildfires don't necessarily have to take place here um, to have pretty significant impacts due to wildfire smoke. Um, so we felt a lot of that already and it's gonna be a big part of what we need to plan for in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the adaptation measures that we're looking at, um, adopting policies to just require the consideration of climate change impacts in city plans and construction projects. So, you know, making sure that we're thinking about um, if projects are going to be developed for how things are gonna be in 50 years, not just for how they are today. Um, we're also developing a vulnerability tool that will help with that analysis. So we'll be able to look at a particular area and see what kind of the major impacts are to the area, whether it's flooding or um, wild, in, wild urban interface, which might have higher wildfire risk. Um, also working to kind of promote um, this idea of social capacity in the community. So helping to prepare the various neighborhoods, get to know their neighbors better, um, and kind of know what the protocols are for an emergency situation, or even just for, you know, if we're having a big heat wave, knowing to check on their neighbors um, who might be at a greater risk for, um, you know, heat exhaustion or something along those lines. Um, next slide, please. We're also looking at <clears throat> the Recycled Water Use Master Plan um, to look at where we can use more recycled water to help kind of take some of the stress off of the potable water supply. Again, looking at that tree canopy and identifying areas of the city that are deficient. Um, these tend to be low income and disadvantaged communities. So there's also an equity component to this 
Um, so getting more trees planted in that area will help improve air quality, help lower temperatures, and also get that uh, carbon sequestration benefit we talked about before. Um, looking at cooling centers and making sure that they can also operate as clean air centers during um, wildfires. Um, <clears throat> another big topic um, that we've been talking about is looking at building quality um, and also adding heat pumps to buildings so that we're able to provide both heating and cooling um, and also have a place improving the kind of air sealing of buildings to improve efficiency, but also help make them more safe and healthy um, in times of, of high wildfire um, risk or I guess high smoke risk. Uh, next slide, please. So like I said, these are all kind of high level strategies and ideas and kind of some example actions that we're currently working on um, with City Staff and the KPAC. Um, we're going to have an online open house um, in, on January. We had an online open house, or no, we will have an online open house on January 28th, which is going to be, um, we'll open the website on the 13th and then have office hours on the 28th. We'll have a couple hours for people to come in and ask specific questions on all of our different, um, all the items we went over today. Um, and then we'll be following up with the public um, with workshops on the draft measures to allow more time to provide feedback and kind of further develop these actions specifically for Livermore. And I think that's it. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Do we, uh, I see uh, Council Member Carling has raised his hand. Ryan and Tricia, thanks very much for that very complete report. I. I support the electrification idea. I think that's a really good one. I was just wondering, you never mentioned the word hydrogen. Does that play a role here at all, fuel cells? You know, we have not been talking much about hydrogen. Um, I don't think it's, it's completely out of the race yet, but we just have seen such a such a big push on the electrification side with battery technology, um, electric vehicles really seeming to come ahead of hydrogen, um, but I think it remains to be seen exactly how that ends up playing out. Well, the California Fuel Cell Partnership is moving, uh, moving apace uh, and uh, implementing more filling stations and that kind of thing. So they s certainly think there's an opportunity for fuel cells in the future. Um, so I think, you know, should the opportunity arise, I think you should consider that as well. I have one more um, question, I guess, as much as anything, but so I'm part of the, um, I sit on the community monitor committee for the Altamont landfill. And uh, we have a meeting later this week and the materials that we got for this, uh, it's a comment from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District about uh, renewing the five-year permit for the, for the landfill. And one of the things that caught my eye, particularly as it relates to the topic we're talking about right now, is that the landfill, the Altamont landfill, is the third largest greenhouse gas emitting landfill in the state. And what Bay Area Air Quality Management District says that it contributes to the Tri-Valley status of being the worst dirty air basin in the state. So do your does your data include um, emissions from the landfill? So the way, should it? If it doesn't, <laughs> the way waste emissions work is there's kind of two different ways for us to quantify waste emissions. Um, the way that we are doing it, and most cities do, is you apply a greenhouse gas emissions factor to each ton of waste that you generated. And that emission factor takes into account kind of average emissions relating to all of the waste processing. So going to the landfill, being sorted, and then sitting there and decomposing over time. Um, and it takes into account kind of average methane capture rates, which is like 75% and flaring the rest and 
Um, that's one way to do it. And, and we tend to do that. And it, that kind of assigns all of the emissions from waste to one individual year. Um, and then you do that again the next year and the next year. The other way to do it is if, say, all of your waste only went to Altamont, which is I don't believe is the case, um, we could do this kind of complicated model. It's called a third order decay model where you calculate all the waste that's gone to that landfill over the years um, and you apportion a certain amount to each individual year and it kind of takes a long time for all that waste to decompose and long story short is we we do capture waste emissions but we don't capture greenhouse gas emissions from Altamont specifically because waste kind of goes a bunch of different places um, do you know if just out of curiosity if it sounds like it's more so like a air quality question at Altamont. Um, so things other than greenhouse gases, do you know kind of what pollutants they're mostly concerned about? I think it's mostly methane and VOCs. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, um, we can definitely look into more deeply if there is methane capture. I, I believe there is, but I don't know if well, it's- Sure there is, but uh, you know, and, and in fact, in fact, the Altamont response to this particular uh, <laughs> comment was that the landfill gas collection system directs the gas to a series of sources to reduce emissions. Well, okay, fine. But it doesn't say that it completely captures it. And it sort of doesn't answer or doesn't address the issue that at least according to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, it's the, it's the third largest GHG emitting landfill in the state, and it contributes to the Tri Valley's status of being the worst dirty air basin in the state. And so, you know, I'm just, I mean, that's what we're talking about here, right? Is is the air and what we're breathing and what what's contributing to the greenhouse gases in the, in the atmosphere. So I was just curious whether or not, I mean, it seems like a big deal, but maybe, I don't know, and, and compared to your pie chart, I don't know where it fits, I guess is one question I have. Um, and I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I think if you were, if we were to add Altamont's total emissions to the pie chart, it would be much bigger than your waste pot, waste slice is now. But you need to remember that like lots of waste has gone to Altamont from all over. So it's kind of, you happen to have this big collector of waste from all these other cities. So in order to get the- sure, I, I agree with you, but many of the cars that drive through this city don't stay here and yet you're yeah. counting those. So, I mean, I understand your point and I'm not trying to create a debate here. I was just curious as to whether you considered it or not and whether or not you thought it was important. So, thank you. Just one other thing to clarify, our uh, emissions inventory for transportation does not count cars that are just passing through the city. Oh, so if they're just driving, yeah, it doesn't include like 580 traffic. So if it's dri if driving around in within our boundaries, we count it. And then if it's driving from Livermore to somewhere else, we count part of it. Or if it's a trip from somewhere else that ends in Livermore, we count part of that. But if it's straight pass through traffic, we don't capture that in our inventory either. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Council Member Monroe, or Vice Mayor Monroe. Sure. Um, thanks. Um, so I, I wanted to go back to that question about count what, what's counted and what isn't. Could you put that slide back up again? I'm, I'm now feeling really confused. <laughs> Um, okay, while you're looking for it, I'll keep talking. Um, so I, I wanted to note that I really appreciated the survey results. I thought they were, um, I, I appreciated that we had a, a pretty good turnout and I appreciated the demographic breakdown. I was a little surprised that there, the youth had not responded since I know this is, um, one of their issues. Um, 
So I'm really glad to see that that's going to be something you're following up on. Um, and I'm just, I'm just seriously puzzled by that. Okay, so here we go. Uh, back to this. So what you're saying is this blue, this blue, this is 55%, right? And that 55% does not count the traffic that comes on 580 every day? Yeah, so the way that we calculate your transportation emissions, and this is um, very standard methodologies for mm -hmm. all climate action plans in California is we count 100% of the trips that are totally within the city, right? So that one's easy. Mm -hmm. Going from one side of the city to the other, you get all of that. Mm -hmm. For trips that start in the city, but say end in Oakland, you mm -hmm. get half of those. And you also get half of the mileage from Oakland to Livermore. So mm -hmm. um, internal to external and external to internal, you, you take 50% of those. And then we completely disregard pass-through um, because that's somebody else's uh, external, internal, internal, external, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It, it does, except for the part where, um, as, as with Council Member Carling, I'm wondering what that does to our actual, I mean, this is sort of similar to, and great, we're not generating the smoke that you know filled our lungs all through August, is there, does that mean we just can't deal with it? We, it's not, we can't make a change. And so this is really what we have control over versus what we don't have control over. Is that sort of a way of thinking about it? Yeah, that's the idea. We try to use, um, in general, we try to include emissions that are under your operational control. So something that, yeah, okay. you kind of have a role in moderating, right? There's, mm -hmm. you, it would be really hard for Livermore to, you know, put roadblocks up on 580 and stop the traffic through. Um, it's just, you're in a bad spot and mm -hmm. for 580. Um, well, I'm, I was thinking we could build a wall, but you know, never mind. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, okay, in, in, in all seriousness, if we wanted to generate that, we're talking, if we're thinking about this as regional issue, if we're thinking about this as a statewide issue, if we're thinking about this as a county issue, which, um, you know, the, the fires are, are statewide, the uh, landfill is county, and then the pass-through is, you know, regional. And we wanted to advocate for Livermore at those levels. Could we get that information? Because we can't, we don't have control over it as a county, but we certainly do have relationships where we're advocating for some of that. So Does that make sense? Are you requesting like the number, the VMT that goes through 580 every day? I, I'm just wondering, well, I'm wondering, first of all, can we get, for example, the VMT that goes through Livermore every day? Um, what Council Member Carling was asking in terms of what the result is from the uh, landfill. And then I'm also wondering about the effect of, you know, again, the statewide effect of, of the, the wildfires, which we have utterly no control over. Um, but that's a much larger issue that if we advocate for or our residents advocate for, we, you know, we have some data to, 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 to put around that. So is that data available to, you know, fairly easily? Yeah, I don't have it currently. I think, you know, for Altima and 580, it's not data that we have as part of this effort. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, would it be possible to get, and how much, how hard would it be to get that? I can, we can definitely take a look at it and see if we could ballpark that. My guess is that if you were to add up the VMT emissions from every vehicle all year that goes on 580, their, you know, complete trip, it would dwarf all of your emissions by probably quite a bit. So it, it would be interesting to see, and we can kind of look around and see if that's something that's- see, th that to me is yeah. really important because what that says is we can take care of all of this, and I think we should, well, as much as we can, um, and we still are left with a huge problem. And so as a city, we have, uh, I mean, you know, it's like living in a, a, a neighborhood and all together, maybe you can work together. So this strikes me as being actually fairly important to get uh, to get that information. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. 
I just on that, I think that's a really interesting uh, note in kind of climate change in general it is that, right? Like you can always scale up to a, a bigger thing and mm-hmm. like, you know, our emissions don't count as much or like aren't aren't as big of a deal because there's like this bigger emission source. Yeah. But I think what it comes down to is is this idea of operational control and making the making the kind of common sense and cost effective um, and data driven changes that reduce your emissions and oh. everyone else does those same things, then the traffic on 580 goes down anyway, if, if that makes sense. It, it, it does. And I'm, I'm going to, I mean, everyone's going to now roll their eyes, but I'm going to say it's a both <laughs> and. Um, it's, you know, I am absolutely not saying we don't do this because there's bigger problems. Absolutely not. But I'm also saying that we should be, we should be building regional partnerships. We should be building uh, 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 um, county partnerships to solve these larger problems at the same time. That's, that's all. So um, um, I had a couple other questions here. Um, speaking as the um, representative for EBCE, I think the opt up is great. Um, Livermore residents haven't seemed to feel quite as wonderful about that. So uh, as we're looking at that, um, I would love to see ways of, of, of reaching out and making the argument um, that this is, some, again, turning to that local issue, that this is something that we can, we can do at a local level. Um, um, I'm really concerned w- with the socioeconomic issues that, this, that are applied here, um, particularly around adaptation. Um, I know that one of the